Well, if you are just joining us this week, we have started a new series last week entitled, I'm In. And last week we realized a few very important things that we need to wrap our minds around. I wanted to repeat them to you today. We're very thankful for Life Church out of Oklahoma who provided the resources for, uh, for this series. Uh, and I love the thoughts of these four truths in God's family. The, last week we talked about the fact that, and the truth that I'm invited. And not just me, but, but you. That, that when we look at what God has invited us to, that we really uh, begin to realize that we're all invited. And, and we talked about how, how that sometimes can seem, for those of us maybe who've lived a life that, that you're not invited, or maybe we, we find ourselves in stages of life where we just don't feel like we're welcomed or we're invited, or maybe, maybe you know, just, and I hate the thought of this, but I know it's a reality for some people, maybe you've walked into buildings like this. And the truth was, you did not feel invited. And last week, we looked at the truth that, that God has invited you. And that it's our desire as a church to be a church that invites others. And to let them realize that there's a God who loves them, who paid the price for their sin, just as he did for all of us. And he asked us, will you come? He stands at the door and knocks. And so the question is not, are you invited? The question becomes, are you going to attend? Well, this week, um, we want to look at the truth of I'm invaluable. You know, whether you feel valuable or not, I want to, I want to test and, and push on that thought with you today. Next week, we're going to look at the fact that I'm influential. And that may seem comical to you because when you look at your life, you think, no, 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 no. I don't lead anyone. I'm not influencing anyone. But the truth is we all influence someone. And last week, we're going to look at the truth that I'm invested, that as a believer in Jesus Christ, that we should be able to make those proclamations. I'm invited, I'm invaluable, I'm influential, and I'm invested through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, this morning, I want you to begin to realize that you are valuable because of who you are as a believer in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian here today, there, there's something ab about you with that title that all of a sudden brings value, not because of, of how you were created, not because of what you're created of, but just because of who you are as a child of God. I'll never forget when I was in seventh grade, um, I was sitting at a youth convention, and one of the speakers got up, and he, he took out a hundred dollar bill, which when you're in seventh grade, really gets your attention, uh, even as a 40 three-year-old, it gets my attention, right? But, but he took out a $100 bill and he popped it. You know how you can pop money and he popped it and he said, uh, he said who wants this $100 bill? And, pff, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I was up uh, instant hand uh, along with hundreds of other young people because everyone wanted the $100 bill. And then he, he famously, as the illustration is, is, is old now because I'm old, uh, the illustration goes, you know, he rolled it up, he crumpled it up and he said, now who wants the $100 bill? It's crumpled. Like, we don't care, right? I, I'm, I'm still taking the $100 bill. He, he threw it on the ground. He stepped on it, and he, and he showed us his shoe. He has got, had dirt on his shoe, and he, he stepped on it. He ground it up. He said, okay, now who wants the $100 bill? And, of course, every hand was still up. You know, we weren't buying that it wasn't worth anything. And he said, exactly. He said, no matter what you've come from today, no matter what life has, has thrown at you, no matter if you feel wrinkled or bruised, the truth is, the truth is, your value is still there because of not the paper, but of what's standing behind it. And I think today we have to realize that you are valuable because of who you are, that God's created you. The psalmist tells us that he knit us together in our mother's womb. What a powerful thought. That before we were even born, God knew us. He, 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 he saw us. He formed us. And that as we come into this world, we can get told so many things. And maybe your story is not this story of a loving family and boy, mama and daddy and, and the grandma and grandpa. And boy, everyone just kind of would dote it on you and they bragged on you. And, and it was just this loving, caring relationship. Maybe your story is the complete opposite. Maybe you grew up in a home that that was not the case. And no one ever told you they loved you. Oh, they, they had just assumed that you knew. And, and they told you maybe once. And then that, that famous line, if it changes, I'll let you know. You know, and... There was just not this loving attitude. You didn't feel valuable. 
Or, or maybe you started off feeling valuable, but then somewhere along the way, you began to get around people that they, they didn't treat you as valuable, and, and they, the relationship didn't go the way that you had always hoped and dreamed in your mind, and the coworkers didn't, they didn't play with, well with others, and, and you just find yourself, you just feel as though that value has begun to degrade over time. And so you find yourselves in moments like these, and you hear that phrase, I am valuable, and you just kind of bring your head down. And you begin to question that thought. I think that we're not only valuable because of who we are, but we're valuable because of what you were created for. You see, I believe that God has created each and every one of us for a purpose. And I believe he's uniquely equipped us as believers in Jesus Christ. That he's gifted each of us differently. And there's power in that. We're going to talk about what that looks like when we come together but I want you to hear the phrase, and I want you to begin to let it sink in. And, and my prayer for you this morning as I was praying in my office before we, you know, church began, and just, just asking God to move, and I, you know, I find myself, this has become a routine. And some moments are longer than other moments. Some weeks there's more fervency than other weeks, and I really don't know why, but there's, just, just, there's something different. But as I was praying this morning, and praying that whoever God would be bringing here today, because we never know who's going to show up, that each and every person would just wrestle with this idea and begin to allow it to sink in just how much God loves you. And whether you see it in yourself or not, that when he looks at you, he sees someone of extreme value. So much so that he would send his one and only son to die for you and for me. Someone once said, and I love this thought, that if, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. And that's, great, that's a great thought. He cares. He loves you. And you may not feel that way today, but I want to I push into that this morning and try to drown out the voices that you've been hearing so that you can listen to the one voice of truth, which is the Lord's. You know, I think one of the dangerous phrases, and I love what Pastor Craig Rochelle said. He says, one of the dangerous phrases that we can begin to tell ourselves, and maybe you've told it to yourself, and, and I, I'm sure that if you found yourself at, at certain moments in your life where maybe you were disengaged from church, or maybe you really weren't as active as you once were, maybe this phrase entered your mind, and, and maybe it's something that you wrestle with currently. That if I weren't here, it really wouldn't matter that much. You ever thought that phrase? I mean, you ever gathered in places like this and thought, I mean, really? I mean, well, <laughs> like if, no one's going to notice if I'm not here. I mean, what, what do I bring to this? I'm, I'm not up here on the platform. You know, I, I don't have this, like, I, I'm not going down the aisles with the little plates. You know, I just, I, am I really that valuable? I, I mean, I, I don't have anything to really teach. I don't really have this great testimony. I mean, my testimony is kind of boring. You know, I, I got saved when I was eight. At a Bible school, you know, my parents, I brought up, got brought up to church. I mean, I just, just really don't feel like I have much to offer. You know, if, if, I, if I don't come today, is it really going to matter? I mean, will anyone really even notice if I'm not there? So we allow ourselves that week, that two weeks, that three weeks, and we begin to believe this lie. If I weren't here, it really wouldn't matter that much. And, and maybe we even make it a little bit more personal. You know, I just, I don't come because no one even cares. Well, the truth is, is that if you've asked Jesus Christ into your life, if you've asked him for forgiveness of the sin, then, then you are a disciple of Christ. You're a Christian, right? And, and, and that defines you, or at least it, it should. It, there should be something different about us. The scripture says that we're, we've been set apart, that we're made holy, that we've been transformed in his image. And so that as a believer in Jesus Christ, there's this title that begins to go over you. And, and, I, and I, there was a game that I saw. I, I love this game. It, it just, you play along with me, all right? So, so, so you know, in, in, in the animal kingdom, that there's certain animals. I mean, every animal has a name. But when you put them together, there's a, there's a name for each one. And each one's different. Like, I wish it was all just pack. Wouldn't that be easy? Like, hey, there's a pack of squirrels. You know, or I don't know what you call a group of squirrels. You may know. But, but you know, there's, there's different names for each one. Like, if you have an elephant, what's the, what's the name for a group of elephants? 
A herd, yes, good job, right? So if you have a group of elephants, it's a herd of elephants. If you have a group of lions, it's a pride, yes. And some of you are like, oh, I'm learning stuff today. This is great, right? A pride of lions. If you have a group of cheetahs, not Cheetos, right? <laughs> That's not my joke. I love that joke, though. But it's not, not Cheetos. It, it's a coalition, right? I mean, wow, that's fancy, right? I mean, I don't know how the Cheetos scored that title, you know, but it's a coalition. A group of donkeys, a pace, all right? A, a group of crows, a murder. I mean, you know there's a story behind that, right? I mean, who, who sees a group of birds and goes, murder, right? So, so a, group, a murder, a group of vultures, a committee, and I'll move on. All right, so, <laughs> so, so there is different names when you put animals together. That's terrible, right? But there's different names when you put animals together that they become, they become identified as different, not just as singular, but as different, okay? And the truth is that when you have a, a Christian, when you put them together, what are they called? They're called together the church, and it's different. And it's powerful, and it's describing a group of people. You know, and we've so often talked about it. It's not describing a building, although we will call the building the church. It's not describing a denomination. It's not describing any of those things. It's describing people who have asked Jesus Christ into their life, and they've gathered together as a group. You would call that group, if you saw that group out in the wild, you would call that group the church or the body of Christ. I love that imagery as well. In fact, Paul talked to the church of God in Corinth about that imagery. He, he, he saw people who were coming into the faith, and they were different people, and some were, some were Jews who were believing that Jesus was the Messiah, and some were Gentiles who had never been included in this worship, but yet they were believing that the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, had come, and that he had come not only for them, but, but, but for all of us. And, and they began to become believers, and as they became believers, it wasn't just the, the, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers. No, no, no. They were just called the church. And Paul says, we're, we're the body of Christ. Together, we are the church. And that, that's a very powerful thing. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he said, I tell you, Peter, that on this rock, in this famous you know, setting where Jesus was asking, who do the people say that I am? And Peter, for once, had this great answer. And he said, you're, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And he says, yes, on that truth, I will build my church. And that when I build my church, the gates of hell will not overcome it. That there's this, this promise that, that God says when we gather together as the, as the church, that, that even the gates of hell, they can't overcome it. And I, and I love that imagery because I've never been attacked by a gate, right? So that in, in, infers that we would be the one advancing as the church. And that as the church, even the gates of hell, no matter what hell throws against us as a church, as a body of believers, nothing can stop us when we're walking in unity through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I get very passionate when we talk about unity, not only because it's what we grew up hearing, <laughs> but it's just because as I, as I grow in ministry and as I've been ministering now for uh, quite a while, you know, I just, I love it when, when the church comes together and when brothers and sisters in Christ, when we lay down everything, we just say, you know what, we're here to worship Jesus. That's why I love Sundays like this. Love it. Because it's just, it just like just a statement of to the community, if nothing else. That we're not divided by the, by the walls. We're not divided by the sign. We're, we're united in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Through the blood that was spilled for you and for me. That we are at the church when we come together. Oh yes, when I'm on my own, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. But where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them, the Lord says. And that we are the church. And that's why when you see two or three geese, when you see two or three elephants, all of a sudden it goes from there's an elephant. So there's a herd. <laughs> there's a believer. So there's a church. And there's power when we come together. We are truly valuable. You see, the Apostle Paul, he wrote to the church of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and following. 
as he was trying to help them understand how they all fit together in this puzzle, coming from different backgrounds, coming from different cultures, coming together as one, as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. How do you operate as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ when you're really not brothers and sisters in life, right? I mean, there's, there's just a difference there. And when you look at the way the church is equipped, what I love about it is it's, you know, just uniqueness. I mean, we all have different backgrounds. We all have, have maybe different cultures that we grew up in. We, we all have, have different likes and dislikes, but we you come together, and all of a sudden now, because we're believers, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. When I, when I got off the plane in Africa in 2005 and we're walking through the airport, you could hear the, the singing, and it was sung with, in an accent I had never heard before, this like very British type accent. It was like, I am, and I'm not going to try it, but it's like, I am the church of God. You know, they were singing these church of God hymns. And, and they were talking about that the, the, they were united in Jesus Christ. And I just thought, man, that's so awesome. And then that Sunday we went to church. And it was church like I'd never seen church before. Because they had, in the middle of service, get this, they had the worship of the dance. <laughs> and now that's happened, never happened in any Church of God congregation. I've never walked into a Church of God congregation and someone goes, hey, who's leading worship of the dance? Right? Uh, trying to get someone to fill that role. But, but on this Sunday at the Church of God in, in, uh, in Ghana, West Africa, there was, there was this little congregation and they were having worship of the dance. And they said, our American visitors are going to lead us. <laughs> And so, so they started, you know, they started dancing, and, uh, and the music started playing, and I turned to my, my buddy, and I said, what are we supposed to do? He's like, I guess we dance, and so we just like dance, and, uh, and so we're following, and then we're just like, they led us down the middle aisle, we're dancing down the middle aisle, and then, and then like by the middle of the aisle, you're into it. Like, I, 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 I mean, I grew up church of God, but by the middle of the aisle, I'm like, yeah, you know, just, you know, just going, worship of the dance, it was different. But there was a the power there because we were unified through the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we were brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet we did things a little bit differently. But we were worshiping Jesus. And there was no doubt in my mind as I heard the people respond to the message of the Lord that these are my brothers and sisters. And that when they pray, they pray in the same name that I pray. And they say, pray with the same faith that I pray with. And that we believe that God has uniquely gifted each and every one of us. We believe that we are invaluable to the kingdom of God. We believe that when God looks at us, he smiles and he desires that relationship with us. Paul says this, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or are free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, would, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Now, I want you to get the, the word picture that, that the Apostle Paul is, is painting for the people. He says, look, as we come together, Jew and Gentile, slave and free. I mean, just think of the diversity of that group coming together for the first time. I mean, for, for many of the Jewish people, this would have been an abomination just months before. I mean, we don't fellowship. We don't worship in this setting you know, we worship at the temple among our own kind, and yet now there's this new law that we are all body, the body of Christ, and that as we come together, we're all equipped differently, and all of us have different roles, but we make up one body. There's a power that's there. And then he kind of helps us understand. He said, just imagine if the whole body were an eye. Now, I don't know if it's because I have young kids, but when I read that phrase, this is what I thought of. <laughs> And that proves I have small children, right? If that's what you think of when you read Paul's words, it's like, yeah, you know, Mike Wazowski. And, uh, but but if, 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 the, if the whole body was an eye, or maybe it's this, maybe if the whole body was an ear, <laughs> you know, how, how ridiculous that would seem. Paul says, you know, where would the other senses come from? It doesn't even make sense that we would all be one thing. But that together through our own uniqueness and through our giftedness, that all of a sudden we become this powerful body of the Lord. You see, every part of the body matters. 
Every part of the body matters. I think it's there that we begin to get tripped up. Because we begin to rate the parts of the body. We begin to, to admire the other parts that we're not. We begin to look and say, boy, I wish I was, I was like that. Because if I was like that, I would be important. Then I could really have a platform to share my testimony. Then God could really use me. Instead of realizing that there's this power in where God has placed us in the body. And there's this great blessing of being a part of the body, the church of God. The body of Christ. And that we're all uniquely gifted. And that every part of the body matters. You see, Paul helped to explain this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. He said, but in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. God has taken all of these individuals and he's placed them to be a part of the body. And he's formed it just as he formed us in our mother's womb. He formed the church as he's uh, putting it together. And he's made it and he placed it, everything, just as he wanted them to be. He goes on in verse 20, As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. (laughs) Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. I and mean, when you look at our body, there's, there's certain parts that you think, okay, you, you got you to have, you know, have the arms, <laughs> you got to have the eyes, right? You, you, you gotta, I mean, but there's, there's smaller, weaker parts that we just don't normally think of, right? No one, I mean, when you're looking at the body, no one goes, pinky toe. If I, sign me up, pinky toe, because I know that's the most important part of the body, right? I mean, we, we don't really think of it that way, but it is very powerful. I mean, with balance and everything else. I tell you what, hit it in the middle of the night and realize that it doesn't affect the rest of the body, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's power in the pinky toe. You know, I mean, there's just different parts of the body that we really don't see, really, really don't recognize. But boy, when it's out of whack, we know it instantly. And we realize how much power it truly does have. Last week, I, I could barely um, move. I, you know, I was just, and, and Elijah made fun of me all day because I was, I was walking like this. Because my back was hurt, and, and it was the upper back, and I had pulled it just being, you know, an idiot. And, and you know, I just, I felt it all day. I never felt that muscle before. In fact, I don't even know what muscle it is. I, I just knew it was back there. I don't even know the name of it, the technical name. But I tell you, when it was hurting, the rest of my body knew. It's an insignificant muscle, I would think. It's not seen. It's not someone goes... Boy, you, you should meet Jonathan. That, that back muscle of his, it's incredible. You know, no one, no one notices the back muscle. No, no one sees it instantly when you walk into a room. You know, I mean, I mean, there's certain aspects of us. People, they recognize your eyes, right? They recognize your smile. No, no one has ever said, that's a back muscle right there. I mean, that's amazing, you know. But when it was hurt, it affected everything I did. And I realized the power. I mean, I couldn't lift. I, I couldn't push with that arm. I couldn't turn. I mean, it affected every, from my waist up, it affected everything. It was, it was incredible to me. And, and the Apostle Paul says, much like that, the parts that of the body that seem to be weaker, they truly are indispensable. We all need each other. Can we recognize that, that, that we all need each other? So when we, when we come into moments like this and we think, you know, I just don't think I would be missed if I wasn't there, that's a lie from the enemy, and I want to tell you why. Because the enemy knows how indispensable you are. And if he can get you to believe that lie, he's, he's began to help stop the body from moving forward. You see, I believe that we all have a purpose i believe that we all have a role to play and i believe that god desires to use that through his church through the body of jesus christ and so when we look at the role in which we play in which we we look at the 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 mannerisms in which we have been gifted that we have to realize the words of the paul that even when it doesn't seem like we have this great uh, ability or when we have this great you know thing that everyone else recognizes that even the weaker things of the body that they're far more significant than we've ever realized I love what Craig Rochelle said. He says, just because what you do does not seem visible does not mean it is not important. You know, there's so many people in my ministry 
and so many people I witnessed as a kid of, of ministries that, that they had that just, I mean, we would, from the outside looking in, we just wouldn't think, you know, that's a, a powerful ministry. But man, it, it truly was when you look at it. I mean, I mean, there, there are folks involved in our, in our church today. You, you rarely will see them up on the platform. But man, the, the faithfulness of their ministry cannot be overstated. It, it's powerful. And, and sometimes it's through prayer. You know, I don't know if you know, we, we've, we've got a, a group of men, they meet every morning uh, in prayer uh, in, in, in one of the classrooms back there. Every more, faithfully, every single morning, 8 a.m., they're there, they're praying. And, you know, it, it, they've been praying for years. And, and I just think, you know, man, they, people don't see that. But you experience the power of that, the benefits of that. Because they intercede for you. They intercede for those who are sick. They intercede for our church. And not only our church, but the churches in the community. And there's a power that's there. Oh, you'll never see it. It's like the back muscle. You'll never see it. But I guarantee you, if it was gone, we would feel it. It's a powerful ministry. There are those, I mean, they, they, they work in different aspects of the church, and they, they serve, and they, they continue to serve, and, and maybe people don't see them all the time, but it's, it's vital, and it's powerful. Some of you here today, you've never been to Guatemala, but you've probably personally sponsored numerous people to go. No one knows that, except you, God, and the church treasurer, but it's been invaluable for those people. You have this gift of giving, and God's blessed you, and you've used it to bless others and to, to invest in his kingdom, and you will never know the fullness of that reward, I don't think, until you, you get to heaven, but it's invaluable, and you've used your giftedness in a way that it's not seen, it's not applauded, but God sees, and it is making a difference. There's one story in the Bible that I was instantly reminded of when I was reading about this, and it's a story of a, of a preacher that we see, this, this communicator of the gospel. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he would speak, he wasn't that well of a communicator. He, he would say himself that, you know, I, I don't come with fancy words. <laughs> I just come with the truth of God's word. And, but there was power in it, not only because of the truth of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, but because of his testimony. I mean, everyone knew this was the guy who used to kill Christians, and now he's one of the leaders of them. And so there was this powerful testimony, but it wasn't with this eloquent words that he would come and, and speak with people. Oh, he was uh, intelligent. Make no mistake that he was intelligent. But as far as a gifted communicator, he probably wasn't the most. And then there was a fellow named Apollos. And Apollos didn't have the same testimony as Paul. I mean, he hadn't gotten knocked off his donkey on the way to Damascus. I mean, he hadn't had this great encounter with God. But he had heard about Jesus through John the Baptist, and he had understood the, the forgiveness of sins. And then he began to learn and, and began to, to preach the Messiahship of Christ because of what he had heard John preach. But as he was preaching about it, the, you know, the people were, were captivated because he was one who came, he could get up and he could speak, and it was powerful. And then just, I mean, just one of those speakers that I mean, just kind of draws you in. And it's that person that we look at today. It says, meanwhile, Acts chapter 18, verse 24, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. He said, well, who's Priscilla and Aquila? Well, this was a married couple, and they were tent makers. They weren't scholars, but they had been, were tent makers who had been won to Jesus Christ through the message of Paul. And, and as they ha had heard and received the message of Paul, they were fellow tent makers with Paul. They had heard the message, and they had begun to grow in their faith. In fact, Priscilla would go on, you know, Paul would, would, would mention them frequently throughout the Gospels. But their ministry, although it was well-known locally, regionally, I mean, typically, if you talk about Priscilla and Aquila, people go, yeah, I think I've heard of them. I, you know, uh, I think my aunt was named Priscilla, you know, something about the Bible. You know, there's, just, there's not this great um, you know, interaction with those names. Or this great thought that, man, those were great pioneers of the faith. But the truth is, in that day, in that moment, that when they heard Apollo speak, they heard this man filled with wisdom, but he just didn't have everything that he needed. 
He didn't understand all of it in the way which related through Jesus Christ. And so they, they brought him. Now, now I, I want to show you the power of that. They brought him to their home and they taught him these things. This is what it means. This is the message. And, and one, the humility of Apollos, who was well-educated and well-spoken, to allow himself to be taught by tent makers. That's a sermon in itself. But to the, the boldness and the understanding of Priscilla and Aquila that, you know what? God hasn't called us to reach the masses, but if we can teach this individual, God's going to use him in a very mighty and powerful way. And they use their giftedness of teaching to help him understand the message of Jesus more fully. And here's what happened. Verse 27. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. And when he arrived, he was a great help to those who, by grace, had, been, had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Priscilla and Quilla, you, are you valuable in God's kingdom? Are you valuable in his church? Well, I mean, we're, we're not this great speaker. No, that's not what I asked. I mean, that's a part of the body. That's not the whole body. I asked, are, are you valuable? Well, I mean, we're just tent makers. No, no, that, that's, that's not who you are. That, that's, that's what you do, but you're a child of the king. The, the, the question was, are you valuable? Well, we're using our gifts to further the kingdom, and that just happened to be teaching, and we, we taught Apollos. He was willing to be taught. And now, what, man, look at the things that he's doing. Invaluable to the kingdom of God. You say, I don't know what God's going to call you to. I don't know the way in which God has gifted you. But what I do know is that as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have been uniquely equipped. And you are a part of his family, his body. And that we cannot do it without you. You see, what happens is, and, and I love this illustration, what happens is if you've ever slept on your arm and woke up and your whole arm was asleep, anyone? That's the scariest five seconds when you wake up, is it not, right? Because you go to move and you can't, I mean, you're just, you know, you, it's just dead, you know, and you're like having to move it around yourself. It's useless. It's pointless. Why? Because it's falling asleep. And church of God, hear me, I wanted to tell you today that, that if you've fallen asleep, that you're not being used by God. Oh, you're still a part of the body. <laughs> but he desires to use your giftedness to, to extend his kingdom. And when you, don't, when you don't use your giftedness, what happens is we all have to kind of do the work for you when that's not how we were created to do. And that's when you get people that say, well, 20% of the people do 80% of the work and 20% of the people get 80% of the you know, All of these things. Why? Because the body isn't operating as the body was supposed to operate. The body was supposed to say, I, you know, I've got a job to do. God, wake me up to it. God, get me excited about it. Lord, I, I don't care what it is. I just want to do what you're calling me to do. You know one of the most fun things I love to do when I'm not here? I just love to greet. <laughs> I, I just love when people come in that you can be that friendly face and like, hey, how's it going? Here's a bulletin. I mean, that's a great job, right? I mean, I just love that. Th there's, other there's other things, other jobs. I just think, okay, that's not my gifting, right? That's not my calling. But whatever it is, what is God calling you to do? Don't cheat the body. Be used by him. And see the joy that comes when you're working together in unity for one purpose, and that purpose is Jesus Christ and him alone. I mean, I mean, what would it look like if we truly realize that you are invaluable? What would happen if you not only could say that phrase, I'm invaluable, but you truly believed it? So when you woke up, it wasn't just a matter of, eh, I just don't know if anyone's going to miss me. No, 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 I'm invaluable. I've got to go. When you woke up on Monday morning and you're going into church, it's not just like, eh, I just don't know. Does anyone really care about this life with Jesus? No, no, no. You're invaluable. I've got to share. You're invaluable. I've got to show the love of Jesus. You're invaluable because I'm a part of a body that's much bigger than me, and they're counting on me to do what God has gifted me to do so that we as a church can do what God has called us to do and make an impact. So much so that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What would happen if you truly believe? Now, now as we end here this morning, I, just, I, I know the excuses that we come up with. 
that, you know, I just, I, I, I think I'm kind of discredited, you know. I mean, I'm not, that sounds really good. And when I was a young person, if I had heard that, boy, I would have been fired up and I would have gone, you know, full guns. I would have been doing it, whatever it was. I would have been doing it. But, but now, I mean, you, you just, I mean, you don't know what I've been through. You, know, you don't know my past, and I, I mean, we just kind of just met, and we're kind of getting to know each other, but, but I mean, if you knew my past, you would probably say, man, thanks, just have a seat, though, you know, <laughs> you're right, we probably can't use you, but we, we'd love to have you come hang out. You know, we begin to discredit ourselves. We begin to say, you know, well, my, my past, I mean, I just, if, if you knew my past, well, you know, I, my divorce, or my addiction, or, you know, I'm just, I'm just too young, you know, or just, I mean, I'm just, I feel like I'm a little bit too old to, to do those things, you know, I'm just not formally trained to kind of speak what God is stirring in my heart. No, 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 don't allow the enemy to discredit you, because I believe that's who's trying to do it, because he knows when you become a part of the body, and you, your part is totally given over to God that that body becomes stronger and becomes much more invincible. And that when we come together as the body of Christ and we say, you know what, I am forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And God has gifted me to do something. And I gotta do it. I mean, how powerful that becomes, together, working together. No one else doing my job. No, no, I'm the one who's got equipped to do my job. And so I'm the one who needs to do it. And so God, give me the strength. And help me drown out the lies of the enemy who would love for me to shut up and sit down because he knows there's power in me. Not because of who I am, but because of whose I am through Jesus Christ. And so God is calling you and he's calling me to enter into this family, this body of believers. Don't allow the enemy to discredit you because he would love to discredit you. But recognize that you have something your story that matters, your voice that matters, your words that matter, your gifts that matter, your generosity, your encouragement, it all, it all matters. You know, I think of my grandfather. My grandfather didn't come to Christ until later, even though he had kind of been brought up in the church, and he accepted the the call to ministry in his his mid-20s. He had just come out of the army. He was a brick mason by trade. He wasn't formally trained, but he just felt like God was calling him to preach. And so that's what he did for the rest of his life. And you know, he never, he never served in this big, massive church. He never grew these massive churches. But man, he served faithfully. And he, he invested in people. And he loved people. And when he preached the word of God, it wasn't through this depth of the Greek and the Hebrew. He just preached what God had laid on his heart and he opened up the word of God and he let the words go forth and he would just speak boldly. And when he would get excited, he would go, well, goody. You know, he's just just that type of guy. And that was him. He wasn't formally trained. You know, I never got that chance to ask him this because he died before I was mature enough to ask it. But if I could ask him one question, I would say, Paul, Paul, Did you ever feel like you were kind of discredited? I mean, was there ever a voice in your heart that thought, you know what, you, there's probably someone better equipped to do this instead of you? I don't know if you ever heard that. I know I hear that voice a lot. That voice that says, what are you thinking? You're not perfect. What are you thinking? You don't have it all together. Why are you going to stand up and tell people when you know that you wrestle as well? That voice that says, you know, there's someone much more charismatic. There's someone much taller. There's someone much whatever that could do the job better than you. Why don't you just sit down and let someone else do that part? Don't allow the enemy to discredit you. God has something for each and every single one of us here today. I believe that with all of my heart. And it's vital to the kingdom of God. And there are people who are waiting to be received the gift that you have to bring. And it may not be hundreds and it may not be thousands, but it may be one and it may be this powerful thing. And you change a family tree. 
It may be the faithful serving week after week after week, and you're wondering, is it even worth it? Does anyone even care only to come up? And I believe in heaven we're going to get to see all that we have done, what it did for the kingdom of God. You are invaluable. God loves you. He's equipped you. Do not sit down, church. Stand up and be those who would say, I know I'm invaluable. And I know that God desires to use me to impact his kingdom. So Lord, show me what it is. Lord God, here I am. Use me. And let's threaten the gates of hell together. Won't you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you today, Lord, I just pray that the enemy would be silenced in this moment. God, that all we would be able to hear is your voice saying, you are valuable. I died for you. Lord, if there's anyone here who's never accepted that this morning, that today as they are just experiencing that feeling of, you know what, that's, that sounds good. I just, I don't know if I'm worthy. God, that, that you would allow them to hear your truth, that you died for them. While just like they are, while they're unworthy, because all of us are unworthy. Lord, that you paid the sacrifice for their sins, that all of those who would believe, who would call upon your name as Lord and as Savior. Lord, and all that means is that we would ask forgiveness for our sins. And we would ask you to be Lord of our life. Lord, that all who would do that would be saved. They would be a part of this body of believers, Christians that when they come together, they are the church, the body of Christ. And God, for those of us, we've been, we've been asleep for a little while, God. Oh, we know that you, what you've gifted us to do, we know what you've called us to do, but we just didn't really feel like it was making a difference. God, would you wake us up this morning? Oh, God, wake us up. And allow us to be revived with the passion that comes when we know that we're doing what God has called us to do, the joy that's present in that moment. And Lord, help everyone to leave this room today knowing that they are invaluable in your eyes. Lord, that you love them, you've called them, you died for them, and you desire to use them in a amazing and powerful way. Lord, teach us what that looks like. We're open. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, I want to invite you to stand this morning. These altars are open and available if you would like to pray. You know, this morning, if God has spoken to you, maybe he's reminded you of that which he's placed inside of you. I want to invite you to just, just let your prayer this morning be, God, God would you... Would you show me how to, how to do what it is that you're calling me to do? Maybe for those that you've just felt lost or forgotten or not worthy or like you really don't matter, that, that today you just make that proclamation, God, I hear you. <laughs> I hear your voice and I just want you to know that I know that I'm invaluable. And church, as a body of believers, that we would let our prayer be this morning. God, would you allow us to move forward in the unity that you've called us to? To recognize that we all play different roles, but they're all important. And would you show us more what that looks like and the role in which we're supposed to play? You know, I believe that sometimes God changes our roles as we continue to grow in him. Stephen in the New Testament started out as one who was waiting tables. And then he was one who was proclaiming the gospel. And then he was one who was the first martyr of the faith. When he started waiting tables, he probably didn't think he was going to be a martyr, but he had this desire to, Lord, God, use me. Whatever you want me to do, God, I want to do. And that's where God led him. I don't know where he's going to lead you, but just be open to what God would say to you this morning. And let's get excited that we're valuable and that together we are the body. Won't you sing with us this morning? These altars are open if you'd like to pray. And... Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're excited to see where God is, is directing us. And as, as Debbie said this morning, if, if you have 
not been a part of a growth group or you're not quite sure what that is, it's just coming together in homes and, and we dive a little bit deeper into the, the message and we just kind of fellowship with one another. So if you haven't done that, I want to invite you. And even if you've done it but you didn't get signed up for this time, there's, there's three, um, there's a table in the back with some clipboards on it. Uh, just find a time that works for you and they would love to have you come this evening and, and tomorrow and be a part of that. So whatever time that works, just find a time that works for you. We would love to have you be a part and, uh, and to uh, join with us. Uh, this evening and tomorrow night. And so before we dismiss, I want to I wanna pray for you as you go, but can we just thank the Union Hill team again? We're so thankful for you guys. Appreciate y'all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we leave this place, God, we leave with excitement, knowing, Lord, that you've called us to great and mighty things. And Lord, while that may not look great and mighty in the day to day, Lord, I pray that the enemy would not blind us to the truth. Lord, that you are awesome and worthy to be praised. Lord, that you're calling us to, to great things through Jesus Christ. And Lord, that as you speak to each and every one of us individually, Lord, I pray that all of our heart's desires would just simply be to go where you've called us to go to do what you've called us to do, to say what you've called us to say, to love the way in which you've called us to love. And we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.